Good evening, dear viewer, whoever and whenever you are. For context, my name's Carter, and since 2021, I've been in charge of all the music for TimCast. Before that, though, I essentially live stream myself narrating books about the terrors of 20th century socialism. And only stopped doing that to focus my time and energy on making the audition tape that got me hired. All this to say, I'd recorded like 20-something chapters of this book before recently coming across the uh, files, so I figured, why not upload them? Keep in mind, I began doing this during the great quarantine of 2020, so I made a creative decision to leave it all as is for historical and nostalgic purposes. Enjoy. Perfect. Perfect. All right, what's up, everyone? If you're just tuning in, I'm Carter Banks. Usually, I make music. But during the quarantine, I've been reading books every night at 9 p.m. Central Time. Uh, first book was Cannibal Island. Second book was Remembering Survival in a Nazi slave labor camp. Every night I read a chapter, and then I put that chapter in its professional audiobook form on YouTube afterwards. So if you happen to tune in during a chapter that is not chapter one, then you can listen to that chapter on YouTube and then get caught up if you want something to do at nine during the quarantine. Cause until the gyms are open, the quarantine ain't over. Anyway, I'm announcing a new book today. Um, still working on getting the other chapters, the last two of Remembering Survival, up. But this book is called... I feel like I'm doing a gender reveal. Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Hold it around so all can see. So, if you are not familiar with Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he basically single-handedly took down the Soviet Union with a book called The Gulag Archipelago, which he wrote while imprisoned in, you know, forced labor in the gulags. He was there for like, I think it was like 13 years or something. He was arrested during the Red Terror or somewhat around that time for uh, writing, exchanging letters with a friend that were critical of Stalin in a dark, humorish kind of way. So he was sentenced to hard labor and uh, saw all kinds of crazy shit going on around, committed this book, you know, half mostly to memory. Uh, and it's a great book. It's brutal. But he is probably the most sarcastic person I've ever read. And this is his autobiographical novel, uh, Cancer Ward, because he got cancer after spending all that time in the gulags. Got cancer. And this is kind of what happened next in his life, as far as I know. But I'm not going to try and you know, talk about the book I haven't read, so I'll just read the foreword today, and then we'll kind of discuss. Okay, there isn't a foreword, but I will read. Yeah, there, there's a thing on it. Oh, wow, this book was ten ninety five when it was first sent out. I bought it for like 50 bucks. It's crazy. So, yeah, this is Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Um... And I'll just start by reading the thing on the inside of the book. Yevgeny Yevtushenko has described Alexander Solzhenitsyn as Russia's only living classic, and Cancer Ward follows in the tradition of the great Russian novels of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. A largely autobiographical account of a group of people who passed through the cancer wing of a provincial Soviet hospital in 1955, it is a vivid portrait of individuals in isolation whose collective concern is disease. Through the stories of patients and doctors, political prisoners and bureaucrats, the young and the old, it probes the fears and the hopes of an entire cross-section of Soviet society. Cancer Ward has been seen as a metaphor for the 
malignancy afflicting the Russian nation, but the moral and ethical questions it raises about love and conscience, life and death, spiritual sorrows and triumphs, rise above all their immediate political context to assume universal significance. This is the complete, unexpurgated edition translated by Nicholas Bethel and David Berg. It includes Solzhenitsyn's world-famous letters to the Fourth Congress of Soviet Writers and the Writers' Union, a transcript of the proceedings, a transcript of the proceedings of a session of Soviet Writers' Secretariat, and an afterword by Vladimir Petrov. Time called it a literary event of the first magnitude by Russia's greatest living prose writer. Unfortunately, he's not living anymore. He died a couple years ago, I think. Um, he's succeeded by his son, Ignat uh, Solzhenitsyn. But yeah, I've been wanting to read this book. Well, I'm not a huge reader, but I've been wanting an audiobook for the longest time, and they don't have one, so I'm going to make it today. Um, so yeah, that's the book. That's what it's going to be about. I was hesitant to try this one because um, after Cannibal Island, I figured I should probably study up on how to say Russian names a little bit more. But, you know, I think I'm just going to wing it and see what happens. So yeah, this should be pretty awesome. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn also wrote A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which is also um, basically a story about, you know, forced labor in uh, Soviet Russia. But uh, yeah, so it looks like chapter one's pretty short. I don't know if everyone's here today, but you know what? I think we'll read chapter one just to get a feel for it. And uh, yeah, we'll do that. So this is going to be chapter one of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, read to you by Carter Banks. Chapter one. No cancer whatsoever. On top of everything, the cancer wing was number 13. Pavel Nikolaevich Rosonov had never been and could never be a superstitious person, but his heart sank when they wrote Wing 13 on his admission card. They should have had the ingenuity to assign number 13 to some kind of prosthetic or intestinal department, but this clinic was the only place where they could help him in the whole republic. It isn't. It isn't cancer, is it, doctor? I haven't got cancer, Pavel Nikolaevich asked, hopefully lightly touching the malevolent tumor on the right side of his neck. It seemed to grow almost daily, yet the tight skin on the outside was as white and inoffensive as ever. Good heavens, no, of course not, Dr. Dontsova soothed him for the tenth time as she filled in the pages of his case history in her bold handwriting. Whenever she wrote, she put on her glasses with rectangular frames rounded at the edges, and she would whisk them off as soon as she had finished. She was no longer a young woman. Her face looked pale and utterly tired. It had happened at the outpatient's reception a few days ago. Patients assigned a cancer department, even as outpatients, found they could not sleep the next night, and Donsova had ordered Pavel Nikolaevich to bed immediately. Unforeseen and unprepared for, the disease had come upon him, a happy man with few cares, like a gale in the space of two weeks. But Pavel Nikolaevich was tormented no less than by the disease itself, by having to enter the clinic as an ordinary patient, just like anyone else. He could hardly remember when he had been in a public hospital last. It was so long ago. Telephone calls had been made to Evgeny Semenovich, Shendiapin, and Olmaspaev. 
and they rang the other people to find out if there were not any VIP wards in the clinic, or whether some small room could not be converted, just for a short time, into a special ward. But the clinic was so cramped for space that nothing could be done. The only success he had managed to achieve through the head doctor was to bypass the waiting room, the public bath, and a change of clothing. Yuri drove his mother and father in their little blue Moskvich right up to the steps at Ward 13. In spite of the slight frost, two women in heavily laundered cotton dressing gowns were standing outside on the open stone porch. The cold made them shudder, but they stood their ground. Beginning with these slovenly dressing gowns, Pavel Nikolaevich found everything in the place unpleasant. The path worn by countless pairs of feet on the cement floor of the porch, the dull doorknobs, all messed about by the patient's hands, the waiting room paint peeling off its floor, its high olive-colored walls, olive seems somehow such a dirty color, and its large slatted wooden benches with not enough room for all the patients. Many of them had come long distances and had to sit on the floor. There were Uzbeks in quilted, wadded coats, old Uzbek women in long white shawls, and young women in lilac, red, and green ones, and all wore high boots with rubbers. One Russian youth, thin as a rail, but with a great bloated stomach, lay there in an unbuttoned coat, which dangled to the floor, taking up a whole bench to himself. He screamed incessantly with pain. His screams deafened Pavel Nikolaevich, and hurt him, so much that it seemed the boy was screaming not with his own pain, but with Rusanov's. Pavel Nikolaevich went white around the mouth, stopped dead, and whispered to his wife, Kappa, I'll die here. I mustn't stay. Let's go back. Kapitolina Matveyevna took him firmly by the arm and said, Pashenka, where could we go? And what would we do then? Well, perhaps we might be able to arrange something in Moscow. Kapitolina Metvayevna turned to her husband. Her broad head was made even broader by its frame of thick, clipped, coppery curls. Pashenka, if we went to Moscow, we might have to wait another two weeks. We might not get there at all. How can we wait? It is bigger every morning. His wife squeezed his hand in an effort to transmit her courage to him. In his civic and official duties, Pavel Nikolaevich was unshakable, and therefore it was similar and all more agreeable for him to be able to rely on his wife in family matters. She made all important decisions quickly and correctly. The boy on the bench was still tearing himself apart with his screams. Perhaps the doctors would come to our house, we'd pay them, Pavel Nikolaevich argued, unsure of himself. Pasik! His wife chided him, suffering as much as her husband. You know I'd be the first to agree. Send for someone and pay the fee, but we've been in this mess before. These doctors don't treat at home, and they won't take money. And there's their equipment, too. It's impossible. Pavel Nikolaevich knew perfectly well it was impossible. He had only mentioned it because he felt he just had to say something. According to the arrangement with the head doctor of the oncology clinic, the head nurse was supposed to wait for them at two o'clock in the afternoon. There, at the foot of the stairs, with a patient on crutches, was carefully descending. But the head nurse was nowhere to be seen, of course, and her little room under the stairs had a padlock on the door. They're all so unreliable, fumed Kapitolina Metvayevna, what do they get paid for? Just as she was, two silver fox furs hugging her shoulders, she set off down the corridor past a notice which read, No entry to persons in outdoor clothes. Pavel Nikolaevich remained standing in the waiting room. Timidly, he tilted his head slightly to the right and felt the tumor that had jutted out between his collarbone and his jaw. He had the impression that in the half hour since he had last look at it in the mirror as he wrapped it up in a muffler. In that one half hour, it seemed to have grown even bigger. 
Pavel Nikolaevich felt weak and wanted to sit down. But the benches looked dirty, and besides, he would have to ask some peasant woman in a scarf with a greasy sack between her feet to move. Somehow, the foul stench of that sack seemed to reach him even from a distance. When will our people learn to travel with clean, tidy suitcases? Still, now that he had this tumor, it didn't matter any longer. Suffering miserably from the young man's cries and from everything that met his eyes and entered his nostrils, Rusanov stood, half leaning on a projection in the wall. A peasant came in carrying in front of him a half-liter jar with a label on it, almost full of yellow liquid. He made no attempt to conceal the jar, but held it aloft triumphantly, as if it were a mug of beer. A mug of beer he had spent some time lining up for. He stopped in front of Pavel Nikolaevich, almost handing him the jar, made as if to ask him something, but looked at his sealskin hat and turned away. He looked around and addressed himself to a patient on crutches. Who do I give this to, brother? The legless man pointed to the door of the laboratory. Pavel Nikolaevich felt quite sick. Again, the outer door opened and the matron came in, dressed only in a white coat. Her face was too long and she was not at all pretty. She spotted Pavel Nikolaevich immediately, guessed who he was and went up to him. I'm sorry, she said breathlessly in her haste her cheeks had flushed in the color of her lipstick. Please forgive me, have you been waiting long? They were bringing some medicine. I had to go sign for it. Pavel Nikolaevich felt like making an acid reply, but he restrained himself. He was glad the wait was over. Yuri came forward in just his suit, with no coat or hat, with the same clothes he had worn for driving. Carrying the suitcase, and a bag of provisions. A blonde forelock was dancing about on his forehead. He was very calm. Come with me, said the matron, leading the way to her little storeroom-like office under the stairs. Nizamuddin Baramovich said she'd bring her own underwear and pajamas. They haven't been worn, have they? Straight from the store. That's absolutely obligatory. Otherwise, they'd have to be disinfected, you understand? Here you can change in there. She opened the plywood door and put on the light. In the little office, with its sloping ceiling, there was no window, only a number of colored pencil diagrams hanging from the walls. Yuri brought in the suitcase silently, then left the room. Pavel Nikolaevich went in to get changed. The matron had meanwhile gone off somewhere, but Kapitolina Metvayevna caught up with her. Nurse, she said, I see you're in a hurry. Yes, I am, rather. What's your name? Mita. That's a strange name. You're not Russian, are you? No, German. You kept us waiting. Yes, I'm sorry. I had to sign for those. Now listen to me, Mita. I want you to know something. My husband is an important man who does extremely valuable work. His name is Pavel Nikolaevich. I see. Pavel Nikolaevich, I'll remember that. He's used to being well looked after, you see, and now he's seriously ill. Couldn't he have a nurse on duty with him permanently? Mita's troubled face grew even more worried. She shook her head. Apart from the theater nurses, we have three nurses to deal with 60 patients and two night nurses. You see, a man could be screaming his head off and dying and no one would come. Why do you think that? Everyone gets proper attention. Everyone. What is there to say to her if she talks about everyone? Do the nurses work in shifts? That's right. They change every 12 hours. This impersonal treatment, it's terrible. My daughter and I would be delighted to take turns sitting up with him. Or I'd be ready to pay for a permanent nurse out of my own pocket. But they tell me that's not allowed either. I'm afraid not. It's never been done before. Anyway, there's nowhere in the ward to put a chair. God, I imagine what this ward's like. I'd like to have a good look at it. How many beds are there? Nine. Your husband's lucky to go right into a ward. 
Some new patients have to lie on the corridors or on the stairs. I'm still going to ask you to arrange with a nurse or an orderly for Pavel Nikolaevich to have private attention. You know the people here. It would be easier for you to arrange it. She said. Already clicked open her big black bag and taken out 350 ruble notes. Her son, who was standing nearby, turned his head away in silence. Mita put both hands behind her back. No, no, I have no right. I'm not giving them to you. Kapitolina Metvayevna held the fan of notes into the front of the matron's uniform. But if it can't be done legally and above board, all I'm doing is paying for services rendered. I'm asking you to be kind enough to pass the money on to the right person. No, no, the matron felt cold all over. We don't do that sort of thing here. The door creaked and Pavel Nikolaevich came out of the matron's den in his new green and brown pajamas and warm fur-trimmed bedroom slippers. On his almost hairless head, he wore a new raspberry-colored Uzbek skullcap. Now that he had removed his winter overcoat, collar, and muffler, the tumor on the side of his neck, the size of a clenched fist, looked strikingly ominous. He could not even hold his head straight any longer. He had to tilt it slightly to one side. His son went in to collect the discarded clothing and put it away in the suitcase. Kapitolina Metvayevna had returned the money to, the, to her purse. She looked anxiously at her husband. Won't you freeze like that? You should have brought a nice warm dress gown with you. I'll bring one when I come. Look, here's a scarf. She took a scarf out of her pocket. Wrap it round your throat so you won't catch a cold. In her silver foxes and her fur coat, she looked three times, as strong as her husband. Now go into the ward and get yourself settled. Unpack your food and think what else you need. I'll sit here and wait. Come down and tell me what you want and I'll bring everything this evening. She never lost her head. She always knew what to do next. In their life together, she had been her husband's true comrade. Pavel Nikolaevich looked at her with a mixture of gratitude and suffering, and then glanced at his son. Well, are you off then, Yuri? I'll take the evening train, father. He came toward them. He always behaved respectfully in his father's presence. He was not by nature an emotional man, and his goodbye to his father was as unemotional as ever. His reactions to life all ran at low voltage. That's right, son. Well, this is your first important official trip. Be sure to set the right tone from the start, and don't be too soft. Mind, your softness could be your downfall. Always remember, you're not Yuri Rosonov. You're not a private individual. You are a representative of the law. Do you understand? Whether or not Yuri understood, it would have been hard at that moment for Pavel Nikolaevich to find more appropriate words. Mita was fussing about and anxious to be going. I'll wait here with Mother, said Yuri with a smile. Don't say goodbye, Dad. Just go. Will you be all right on your own? Mita asked. Can't you see the man can hardly stand up? Can you at least take him to his bed and carry his bags for him? Orphan-like, Pavel Nikolaevich looked back at his family, refused the supporting arm Mita offered, and, grasping the banister firmly, started to walk upstairs. His heart was beating violently. Not at all, so far, because of the climb. He went up the stairs as people mount. What do they call it? A sort of platform where men have their heads cut off? The matron ran on upstairs in front of him, carrying his bag, shouted something from the top to someone called Maria, and before Pavel Nikolaevich had finished, the first flight was already running past him down the other side of the staircase and out of the building, thereby showing Kapitolina Metvayevna what sort of solicitude her husband could expect at this place. Pavel Nikolaevich slowly climbed up onto the landing, a long, wide one, such as is only found in old buildings. On this middle landing, but not obstructing the traffic, were two beds occupied by patients with two night tables beside them. One of the patients was in a bad way. He was physically wasted and sucking an oxygen balloon. Trying not to look at the man's hopeless face, Rasunov turned and went on. 
looking upward as he climbed. But there was no encouragement for him at the end of the second flight either. A nurse, Maria, was standing there, her dark, icon-like face lit by neither smile nor greeting. Tall, thin, and flat-chested, she waited for him there like a sentry and immediately set off across the upstairs. Upstairs hallway to show him where to go. Leading off the hall were several doors just left, clear by more beds with patients in them. In a little windowless alcove underneath a constantly lit table lamp stood the nurse's writing table and treatment table, and nearby hung a frosted glass wall closet with a red cross painted on it. They went past the little tables, past a bed too, and then Maria pointed her long, thin hand and said, second from the window. And already she was rushing off. An unpleasant feature of all public hospitals is that nobody stops for a moment to exchange a few words. The doors into the ward were always kept wide open, but still, as he crossed the threshold, Pavel Nikolaevich was conscious of a close, moist, partly medicinal odor. For someone as sensitive to smells as he, it was sheer torment. The beds stood in surried ranks, with their heads to the wall and narrow spaces between them no wider than a bedside table, while the passageway down the middle on the ward was just wide enough for two people to pass. In this passageway stood a thick-set, broad-shouldered patient in pink-striped pajamas. His neck was completely wrapped in thick, tight bandages which reached almost to the lobes of his ears. The white constricting ring prevented free movement of his heavy block of a head overgrown with a fox-brown thatch. He was talking hoarsely to his fellow patients, and they were listening from their beds. On Rusanov's entry, he swung his whole body toward him, the head welded to it. He looked at him without sympathy and said, "'Well, what have we here?' Another nice little cancer. Pavel Nikolaevich saw no need to reply to such familiarity. He sensed that the whole room was staring at him, but he had no wish to examine these people whom chance had thrown in his path or even to exchange greetings with them. He merely waved his hand at the fox-haired patient to make him get out of his way. The other allowed Pavel Nikolaevich to pass and again turned his whole body head riveted on top to look after him. "'Hey, friend, what have you got cancer of?' he asked in his throaty voice. Pavel Nikolaevich had already reached his bed. He felt as if the question had scraped his skin. He raised his eyes toward the impudent lout and tried not to lose his temper. All the same, his shoulders twitched as he said with dignity, "'I have cancer of nothing. I have no cancer whatsoever.' The fox-haired patient snorted. Then he passed judgment so that the whole ward could hear. Stupid fool, if it's not cancer, what the hell do you think they put you here for? That's the end of chapter one of Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Read to you by Carter Banks. Um, so yeah, we're going to stop there for tonight. This actually seems like a pretty... Pretty fun book. Not too much trouble pronouncing names thus far, but we'll see. Uh, if you guys like the way this book is going so far, definitely let me know. If you don't like it, you can let me know too. If you have a book suggestion, feel free to suggest that. And I will see you tomorrow at 9 for chapter 2. Thanks for tuning in.